goals like ideals are invaluable. But just sitting around and thinking about how much Michael Jordan practiced or was in the gym practicing, that's not going to make you much better. And we are back, baby, with another reflection on the Daily Vedante. You thought I was going to keep it straight and narrow in that intro. For a second there, I thought I was too. And I added in a voluminous, volumin, voluminous, voluminous, a voluminous curveball in there. Never know what you're going to get. I never know what I'm going to get out of an episode on the TDV. I, I roughly have an outline. And then sometimes I go on a random unrelated segue like this before my intellect jumps in and guides us back to the theme of the episode. And this theme is on goals. So recently we've had an episode and reflections on plunging into the present, not getting caught up in the future or past and the benefits to all of our actions and endeavors when we do that. We also have talked about the fact that the ideal is equated to the proper identification. And it occurred to me, some people might have questions on, okay, well, if we're plunging into the present, if we're supposed to think about the present, not supposed to think, not not supposed to think, not supposed to think about the future and We're not supposed to think about the past within our daily lives, within our work. Are we supposed to have goals? And the answer is unequivocally yes. We should have goals just like we should have ideals. Growing up playing basketball, I loved watching Michael Jordan. It is so valuable to see an ideal, a perfect direct benefit of having that ideal is I would hear and read, listen to these stories of how hard he worked. And it made me work really hard to get good at basketball. That ideal spilled into seeing that ideal, hearing about that ideal spilled into my daily life. That has been the case with mentors and business leaders. That has certainly been the case with Swami. You get to see the ideal and it elevates everything about you if you have that ideal. The same is the case for the ideal for the intellect. The episode recently that touches on this, I think, beautifully, and I'll tell you why it touches, why it's part of this conversation around goals in a second, but the episode around the ideal equaling the proper identification, knowing who we truly are. That is the ultimate ideal within this philosophy of Vedanta. Finding out who we truly are. The proper identification. Instead of the illusory, the frustrating misidentification of who we often think we are. Or who we think we should be. Or who others tell us we are, but we don't want to believe that misidentification. The tension we find ourselves in who we are. Who others want us to be and who we think we are. That tension is undone, is pacified when we have the proper identification. That's what this philosophy is all about. That is what the sages and saints, the walking ideals, talk about. It's nearly all they talk about is that proper identification, that conceptual ideal. And they live it. They live out that proper identification as an example, as a lighthouse for all of us to attain that proper identification as well. That ideal is critical on the path because without an ideal, we are lost. Goals within our practical lives is very similar. Without goals, you and your business, you and a person you might be in a relationship with without goals, you and your business, you and your team are lost. Without goals, 
than your family. You are lost without goals for yourself. We are told through this philosophy that we are lost. So what is the proper proportion? The dose makes the medicine after all. So what is the proper proportion, not just to value goals, but what's the proper proportion of time to spend thinking about our goals? Well, if your goal is rooted in timeless wisdom, then your goal will align with the philosophical or spiritual ideals that you are striving for as well. Maybe it's your business and it is a goal of a practical understanding, a proper assessment of your expectations of what is achievable, aligned with your spiritual perspective and identification with your customers to where you say, you know what, we want to impact 50,000 people's lives by the end of this year through a profoundly deep, thoughtful expression of union with them through our products that we create. It could be accounting software. It could be a painting business for homes and anything in between, but it is an identification with 10, 20, 50,000 people that you want to serve by the end of the year or by the end of the decade. That identification, instead of a separation of, I want to get my customers money so that I'll have more. It's more of this is the service, the value that I want to create, to give. And I'm sure I'll be compensated for it. It's just natural. That's how it goes. You provide something of significant value, word gets out. People want to pay you an appropriate amount for that value. And the people that don't, you just, you can't serve because you know, you know the value of your craft. You know how to make it sustainable. You know how to reach that goal of 50,000 people serve, but it comes from a union, an identification with those customers. It doesn't come from, that goal does not come from value. That goal does not come from a sense of separation or otherness from those customers, a sense of how can I capture value from an opportunity or from others? It's how do I create value? So aligning your business goals with your spiritual goals, that's the only way to have harmony in life. And that is why people with strong philosophical, spiritual pursuits in their life, they can't work for most companies because most companies, most teams, most goals are value capture based instead of value creation based. But let's say you have perfect alignment of your spiritual and philosophical worldview and your goals within your company, your team, might even be your family. If you have that alignment between those two, then what do you do? You spend time thinking about what is that right goal for whatever that time period is, and you always start from the future and work backwards. Maybe it's the number of customers you wanna serve over the next decade. If you know you're gonna, if you know you're living into your nature, You're building something that you want to create as much value with for those around you as possible, then you should be thinking in terms of decades instead of years, months, or weeks. But you start from the future and you work backwards. Then you say, okay, 10 years down the road, this is what I want. This is what we have a chance to create in terms of value for our communities. Working backwards, This is where we should be if we want to be there. In 10 years, this is where we should be in five. And if we want to be there, this is where we should be in one. This is where we should be six months from now. This is where we should be 90 days from now. And it will help you inform all the way back to this is where we should be one month from now. And this is what we should work on today. Or what you personally should work on that day, that week, that month, towards those goals that ladder up over the next five, 10, maybe 30 years. That's using the intellect to see the end in the beginning, to stack what you're going to do today towards what you really want to see tomorrow, what you want to see created for your communities, your coworkers, your family, 30 years from now. And once you've spent that time, and it might take 
few days or hours to outline those goals. Once you've spent that time to outline those goals and you know what you need to be working on, by all means, reassess, readjust your expectations or what is achievable as you get more information from the work you're doing, especially if you're in the early, early, early innings of it. You might not know what is achievable. Although I will say, as Bill Gates famously, famously put it, humans vastly overestimate what can be accomplished in one year and vastly underestimate what can be accomplished in 10. It is our nature to vastly underestimate what we can do in 10 years. It's a long time, much less 20 or 30. But as you get more information, you maybe reassess the numbers. You get to a place where you spend about 1% of your time thinking about the goal, 99% of your time plunging into the present towards that goal. So let me say that again. Goals like ideals are invaluable. But just sitting around and thinking about how much Michael Jordan practiced or was in the gym practicing, that's not going to make you much better. To know the ideal, to reflect on the the ideal, that is invaluable. But 99% of the time, it is putting it into practice. Having a goal, knowing what that goal is. The goal might be to set a world record in the 100-meter dash. But once that goal is set, 99% of the time. And again, maybe a few minutes each day is assessing You're tracking towards your progress, towards that goal, but 99% of the time is plunging into the present and doing what's needed to make that goal achievable. A goal for your family might be the self-realization of your children. That goal might be something you think about for 12 seconds a day. And then it's a whole lot of practice, work, plunging into the present, reflection, study, service, devotion, a whole lot of all of those to make that goal even remotely possible. Those 12 seconds a day of thinking about it, seeing how you're tracking towards it, again, 1% of the time, it is invaluable. But in terms of the dose makes the medicine, and an improper dose makes a poison, in terms of the proper proportion, you should reflect and think about our goals 1% of the time. 1%, as they say, inspiration, 99% perspiration. With 99% of our time, our focus, our thought flow, going into the present moment that we no doubt used our intellect to outline will help us towards our goal, towards our ideals. But 99% of our time, our focus, our intellect, our mind, and our work going into the present moment, not constantly thinking about goals, not constantly reflecting on ideals, plunging into the present, plunging into the present practice before you not thinking about the future, but fully concentrated, focused on the present that makes that future possible. The goal for this project, by the way, the Daily Vedantic, is really just to make this philosophy accessible for those that seek it. I got this goal from my teacher Joseph with his nonprofit of making Vedanta accessible. It's it's a US-based 501c3. I had the blessing of seeing the charter and seeing the goal that he had for that nonprofit. And it's just to make the philosophy of Vedanta accessible. There's no number to it because as I heard one wise person once say, anything to do with numbers has nothing to do with God. So there's no numbers tied to this project. I think that numbers so oftentimes, I think the numbers can get quantity is often at odds with quality. 
but certainly with something that I just, we all that teach this philosophy know, one in 10,000 find it interesting, find it resonant with them. Sometimes there are pursuits that you do just because it stirs you up and there's, there's no service outside yourself associated with it beyond knitting or playing the drums. Sometimes it is a service where there is no number tied to it. There's no metric tied to it. That is also very much an option. And it's important to make that explicit that sometimes, perhaps oftentimes, goals don't need to be infused with infinite ambition. Maybe a business requires a certain number of customers to be sustainable as a business, to be able to provide that service. But there is so much service around us, so much opportunity around us to do things that don't require massive numbers of people joining in for it to be worthwhile, for it to be helpful to one or two people. And it's worth calling out that sometimes goals can be that simple. Just making something that you value available and accessible to your community. That's today's reflection on the Daily Vedantic. We'll see you next time.